as well. So Professor Coles is here from Cavendish, and actually this whole session will be from Cavendish people. So, uh, okay, Professor Hyde Coles, how are you going to understand? Yeah, I guess it will be the presentation, is not it? Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, that, most people wander around with photographs of their wife or their kids or something. That's my job, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and he goes everywhere with me. He's got more ear than I have. Yeah. You've heard that joke before, right? Okay. Right, I want to take you into a story. And it's a story about five mesogens. That's different crystals with um, two entities, two, two parts. And uh, they give some rather interesting effects, as I'll try and show you. Uh, all of the materials I'll talk about are chiral. Uh, so they have a chiral group uh, either in their structure or a chiral attitude. And I have to thank, before I start, because I tend to talk for too long and I forget to thank people, um, the guys who've done most of the work that I'm talking about. They're all around here, or you've heard them, or you'll see them. Okay. And without, without these guys and gals, we wouldn't do what we do. Uh, first of all, I want to talk, I'm going to talk about chiral pneumatics. So you have a pneumatic system, you twist it up either using a, a chiral additive or high twisting power additive um, to give you a, a chiral pneumatic phase when you see these plant arm textures and you've heard all about that over the last 10 days or so. You can equally have a chiral smectic, although I won't talk about those today, but you can actually make chiral smectic lasers and we've done that in the past. Uh, equally I'll mention very briefly blue phases, another chiral structure, a double uh, structure, which also gives laser devices, and Steve will talk, I guess, a little bit about that uh, later on. So we're going to talk about initially chiromimatics, bimesogen, so that's two liquid crystal groups joined through their arc on the or the metaphysical spaces. Um, and the, the first thing I'm interested in is flexoelectric phenomena, and again, you should have heard about that. It's where you get a, a deformation of the director that generates a polarization that generates an electro-optic effect. Um, I'll tell you why we use bimesogens, and it's very specific to flexoelectric phenomena. Uh, what some of those materials' properties are and characteristics are, and what a display device may look like. In fact, I'll show you what a display device does look like. Okay, and I'll mention very briefly towards the end the blue phase stuff that we did about uh, seven or eight years ago, and Flynn will talk about that later, <coughs> and Steve will talk about the, the lasers. Okay, so they sort of the talk sort of goes together, and, and I hope it goes together. So first of all, chiral pneumatics, so a, a, a rotating director um, up the optic axis of the helix. Okay? You worry about the pitch in the system, and the pitch is very important. The pitch is very important. If you go to your local chemist or your local pharmacy, and you buy a little forehead thermometer, you're buying a very high-tech device. You're buying a photonic band gap device that is thermally tunable. Okay, so when you stick the thermometer on your head, it changes color. You move the photonic band gap. Okay, so it's really high-tech stuff, and it's been around for many, many years. But the first liquid crystals discovered, cholesterols, were um, photonic band gap materials, 1888. Okay, so they've been around a long time. Uh, in nature, they've been around a lot longer. What you do if you had a, a photonic band gap, for example, you have a, a helicoidal structure that uh, shine white light on, you get a reflected light, and you get a transmitted light, and that generates the photonic band gap. And that relates to the pitch in your system. So where that band gap occurs uh, depends on the pitch. And the bandwidth of that primarily depends on the birefringence of your liquid crystal. So you can make that a very narrow band gap or a very broad band gap. A reflecting device, if you will. Why am I, why, why am I interested specifically in the flexoelectric? Primarily, it's a very fast electroelectric response. It's equally as fast as any ferroelectric if you set it up right. Okay, so we'll be talking about an electro electrooptic phenomenon switching in 10 to 100 microseconds. The switching effect is linear with the field. So if you put a small voltage on, you get a small change in light level, a higher voltage, you get a higher level, and so on. So you get what we call brain scale. Uh, unlike cholesterols or cholesterols, we want to make, in our, in our systems, temperature-independent devices. We can do that by, by choosing our materials and show you how to do that. The, the electro-optic effect I'll first talk about is an in-plane switching device. So what that means is the optic axis 
of the, of the device is in the plane of the device and rotates in the plane of the device. So two electrodes and the, and the uh, director moving in plane. Um, that, that, that's the um, same electro optics in essence as you've got in your iPad or, or iPhone, the, the uh, LGD for example, um, IPS or in-plane switching device. Because of that, and because of the optics, you can get very, very high contrast. And that ultimately leads you to, films leads you to a very wide viewing lens. Okay. In essence, the system is very simple. You, you've looked down microscopes and you've seen Grandjean textures, so that in this case, uh, the fancy word is uniform standing helix or Grandjean texture. Okay. So the, the optic axis is up through the device. You can apply a, a field and three different frequencies and you can tilt that, up, that up optic axis over until you get either a, a, a Norwegian street type pattern or a focal conic type texture, or if you treat this system properly, you can get a uniform line helix. And it's the uniform line helix and the uniform standing helix that I'm primarily interested in. So two things you have to remember. Helix up, the optic axis perpendicular to the substrates, or uh, line down, optic axis in the plane of the device. If you apply a very high field, you can unwind that helix. And I don't actually want to do that, because that would destroy the device that I'm about to try and make tell you about. So, flex electricity, in essence, is <coughs> Take a, um, most liquid crystals are photoelectric. I mentioned today all crystals are. Um, cyanobiphenols, the simple molecules you have heard about, John Whitby, um, actually are pear shaped. If you, if you mechanically distort that, that system with a directed field, you'll actually generate a polarization. In fact, it's small, but it's there. And if you can generate, if you can distort, you can generate polarization, then you have electricity. Flexoelectricity is no more, no less than piezoelectricity, if you're a physicist, in a liquid crystal. So piezoelectricity in a crystal, flexoelectricity in a, in, a, in a liquid. And you normally have pear-shaped molecules or bench-shaped molecules. I'm going to talk primarily about the bench-shaped molecules and how they distort. When you, uh, if you make your helix uh, and you wind it up, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time, Bob Mayer has written some very nice papers and there's a reference. If you go to our website, you'll find the references. Um, but if you apply a field across your, if, if in the quiescent state with no field applied, then you have an undistorted helix. Apply a field down through the device, you actually rotate the optic axis through the flexoelectric phenomenon. All you need to worry about is you're getting an in-plane switch or an optic axis. Polarity up or polarity down, and the optic axis moves in different directions, so minus sign and plus sign. So you can switch back and forth. And it's that switching back and forth that gives you the linearity, uh, certainly for small angles, or less than small angles. At four angles, it turns out to be about 45 degrees, so it's not an issue. So if you wanted to make a uniform line helix device, that's what you do. You take um, your substrates, have a line in this, and there are, there, there are tricks involved in getting the uniform line helix to lie uniformly. But in essence, the, the coil of the spring, the DNA or the car motor car spring, if you like, is in the plane of the device with an optic axis or helix axis in the plane. <coughs> you apply a field down through the system, and you see that optical switch or optical rotation. Okay. And some of the, no, I think the nicest pioneer in the world was done by the uh, Gutenberg group uh, many years ago now. Uh, on, on showing these effects. That's when everybody was friends. Okay? Uh, it's a very nice piece of work and some very nice papers around that time if you want to look at. But what, what you're interested in is the macroscopic effect is a distortion of the helix and it's an in-plane optical switch. And that's what makes your iPad so good. Okay? That's what makes the optics of it so good. So, what you're doing, I showed you a few minutes ago, applying fields with the system and the optical the, the like the helix is distorting, the spring is distorting, and the optic axis rotates. True cross polars, you see light transmission. It turns out that's a very useful thing to be able to, to use. Um, the, the key lectures, the key papers, sorry, were written by Bob Mayer a long time ago, 1969. Um, so, but you'll find all of the original work in there. There are a number of things that are important in the flexoelectric effect, and why it's useful. Um, 
Firstly, the <coughs> tilt angle, the ten to the first approximation of the tilt uh, time, depends on the field. And then E over K, which is this flexoelectric and flexoelastic coefficient. The pitch in the system, and to, to a large extent, um, tan phi becomes temperature independent because these terms cancel out to an approximation of trees later. The interesting phenomenon that's perhaps different in the, in the flexoelectric coupling is the response time doesn't depend on the field. Okay, so you have a system where the response, again to a first approximation, where two electric fields does not depend on the electric field. It depends on the, uh, the viscosity of the system, the elasticity of the system, um, and the pitch. So if you want a fast switching device, you want a small pitch. It's a squared term. Okay, so you want short pitch material, and it's that that gives you this tens of microseconds or hundreds of microseconds switching time. Okay. You also want to lower the uh, effective viscoelastic constant. I'll come back to that in a moment. What you don't want in your system is to unwind the helix. A couple of slides ago I said if you apply too high a field, the helix unwinds and you lose, you lose the electron. So, why does that occur? That occurs through the dielectric coupling in your material. So, you want a material, if you want a high critical field, that, that's the highest field you can get to before your device becomes useless, then you want a low dielectric anisotropy. So, a low positive dielectric constant. And you also want a short pitch. Okay, that's in, in there as well. And it's those factors that you can use to make very, very fast devices that we, that we I'll show you in a minute. To prove to you that it's, uh, the effect is linear, uh, I've got an applied field across my device, okay, that's the triangular wave, and then underneath there you've got the, the electrolytic response. So you have a grayscale, the more voltage you apply, the more signal you see. So you've got a grayscale device. Okay. And you can prove that it's uh, monopolar, that's to uh, say it depends on the direction in which you apply your field. If I put a bipolar pulse, that's one that goes positive, negative, positive, negative, then I see Positive thigh, negative thigh, up, down, up, down of the rotation of the axis. If I put a monopolar, that's just a single voltage in one direction, then I and take the field off, then I see the decay time. What's important is that decay time is fast. Okay, so it depends on the elasticity, the elasticity and the pitch in your material. So, what do we want? We, we want a strong dipole. Coupling with the, uh, the flexor of chisity, but a, a, a strong dipole gives you normally a high dielectric coupling, and you don't want that. So, what we do is actually make what we call bimesogens, where we can put very strong dipoles out, pointing left and pointing right as you look at the screen. And that gives you a low delta epsilon. But the fact that the molecule can distort, or the director field can distort, allows you to create flexor electricity. And we use many uh, polyfluorinated um, uh, rings on these structures to give us high dipoles. Come in, Lenny. You can't sneak in here. <laughs> the first materials we looked at were the biphenyls. Um, George Gray many years ago, 1972, 73, discovered the cyanobiphenols that led to the early tristan displays. What we did was take those compounds, which are the, the, the alkaloxid uh, cyanobiphenols, and couple them end to end to prove that we could get a high flexoelectric coefficient. And indeed, that's what you see there. You see switching angles of plus 20 degrees, 25 degrees uh, of low fields, 6 volts per micron. The disadvantage of that system, uh, I should say, it was three orders of magnitude better than anything that had gone before, was the high temperature. You don't really want a display device to work at 183 degrees Celsius. It's a bit, a bit hot. So we went around. Um, what we wanted to do was use this as a model system to prove that we had strong flexoelectric coupling. That's that angle there. But that we had a low delta epsilon, so the helix didn't unwind. So even though you were up at, say, 180 degrees Celsius, you didn't unwind the helix in your system. Okay, so it proved that the delta epsilon factor could be reduced. It also showed that you could get fast response times in the uh, early materials. Again, these are high temperatures, so they work a little faster. But you showed 
with these simple structures that you can still get 20, 40 microseconds, not milliseconds, microseconds, okay. which is the kind of um, response time you might expect from a, uh, a ferroelectric. These are the simple structures with just silo groups on either end. Okay. So that started the program of work about 10, 12 years ago now, I guess, to make better materials. But again, the response times are fast. So that's the in there, 20, 40 microseconds. Um, and it showed, to a good approximation, the linearity that we were looking at. So then we said, well, how can we get down the operating temperatures? And one of the best ways of getting operating temperatures down in a liquid crystal is to start fluorinating the rings. Okay, so um, this is what, that's what we started doing, replacing the cyanide groups by fluorines. That brought down the operating temperatures to around the room temperature. But what you notice is very, very large switching angles. That's, that's in the monopolar cost. Okay, so you're switching plus 40 degrees, minus 40 degrees. Between cross polars, you only need 22 and a half. Okay? So it opens up a whole range of other things that you can do. Um, the total switching angle is plus 9, minus 9, so that's 22 and a half one way, 22 and a half the other, that's 45 degrees. That's maximum transmission through cross polars. Okay. But the fields are open. Okay, you're talking about volts per micron. Okay. Uh, the numbers there are the temperature range between those different plots. There's very little temperature dependency in the switching of that particular material. That's one of the early materials. Um, but it showed why we got interested, shows why we got interested, showed why we got interested in biphenols. In, in, in biphenols by messages. Okay. If you wanted to make, per chance, a fluorescent device or a dichroic device, um, you could have a switching angle of 90 degrees, get rid of a polarizer, and actually make a very fast air to shutter. Okay, that's just something you might want to look up in your own time. There's a whole, you can find all these, these if you look at the CMMP website, you can find all these references. Okay. Um, and you have a copy of this anyway. As everybody knows, the shape is important. Whether you're round, long and thin, or whatever, it's important. And nothing more so true than with the bimetogens. If you have an odd number of methylene groups, that's CH2 groups, if you're a physicist, um, if you have an odd, odd number or an even number, alters the response that you see. <coughs> In fact, for most spectroelectric materials we make, we use mixtures of odd spaces, so odd numbers of CH2s, okay? And you can see that in the, in the response there. You've always got a factor of two difference between, but just, just adding in one methylene spacer to, uh, to, to, an to, to make an even material. And those are the compounds that give the highest speed of decay that you've seen. And it's kind of logical, because you kind of, if you think about an odd number of CH2 groups in your, mo in your molecule, the molecule becomes intrinsically bent. Again, I said it's important for the response time. That was the tilt angle. Equally, the response time is 50 microseconds, 40 microseconds. Um, that's fast for the device. Your iPad is probably working at about 10 milliseconds. Okay. There are thereabouts. So, it's two or three orders of magnitude faster. But again, the shape of the molecules matter. Okay, so you, you have to play a game when you The odd even effect was researched massively by, by Jeff Rackers and his group down in Southampton uh, in the UK. Um, just changing the number of methylene units jumps the biofringence from 0.2 to 0.24, uh, the phase transition temperatures by, let's say here, 100 to 150. Just changing one group, one molecular, uh, one methylene spacer. And you get these massive odd even effects, which are interesting theoretically, they're interesting for modeling. They're very interesting when you want to combine materials to make mixtures. Okay, and that's, that's the game we play. Uh, you, you can see it in that little table. There's a lot of information there. Don't worry too much about um, fine detail. What I wanted to do is just show you that for the, for the red numbers, where you've got 9, 5, 11, 7, 9, 11, that's the number of methylene units. And that gives you the E over K value. And there are the order, in this, these materials, they're the order of 1.3, 1.4. If you go to the even members, so 6, 8, 10, 12, 
they're much lower. They're a half. Because you get half electrical to be failed. Equally though, the response times are still fast for those odd members. Okay. And again, um, the, the fields you apply are fairly low. You're talking about 5, 6 volts per micro. I'll come back to that. So what you would do if you want to make a mixture, uh, a mixture is you start combining uh, biphenols, terphenols, polyfluorinated materials, and make mixtures up of these kind of compounds. Um, it allows you to engineer the E over K value. It allows you to engineer the operating voltage of your device. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's just in, in passing, sorry. So, you, so you, may, you may have four, five, six, seven components to make, to make those kind of mixtures up. Um, yeah. if, you choose, if you get the pitch of your system right, uh, you can get the tilt angles to be switching around 22 and a half degrees. You can get response times. These, these are some early mixtures, so milliseconds downwards. Okay. Again, that's all in the literature somewhere. But what's important, I think, is for a fire infringement device, so that's your good as stretch cellar tape, if you like, between cross polars. Um, as you rotate it, you want a plus minus 22 and a half degrees. You're talking about two, three, four volts <coughs> of micron. So it's a low field, it can be a low field device. Um, that's just a, a, a cell we made up of. I've displaced the uh, bar, bar there to show you the length scale. That was a centimeter square cell um, in the uh, uniform line helix, so it's the helix in the horizontal plane, and then switching that off to the dark scale. So you switch back and back forth. It showed you that you could start getting high contrast material with high contrast devices. So we then, with Tim um, and colleagues across in engineering, we, we actually started putting these materials down onto silicon. So you have flexoelectric materials over silicon. And that's what leads you ultimately <coughs> to high speed holographics. Because you've got a fast switching device now, you can switch it in, let's say, 10, 100 microseconds. Um, you can high complexity, but you can switch it in an L-cost configuration. And that's something that's being very actively pursued at the moment. So, biomesogens. You want strong dipoles at the end of the molecule, but you want them to counteract each other. Um, you want a high critical field, which you've shown you how to do that. Um, you play with the E over K value, that's by changing with the different uh, biomesogens. When we started this game, uh, if you take um, 7 CB or 5, C, 5 CB, depends on time by phenol, you probably get a value of E over K of around 1, maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.7, thereabouts, depends on the temperature a little bit. But you can easily get up to 5, 6, and maybe higher with the biomesogenic structures. So, what you're starting to do already is build in a design paradigm for your materials. You want your electro-optic effect, you can make it fast, you can make it slow, and you start altering the bioprimage of your material. You can have a high bioprimage material that would normally go in parallel with having a high polarizability of one of the mesogens. And you can start making very low voltage devices. Okay, so you're talking about switching angles 45 degrees, 2 volts per micron. And that worked perfectly well with the L-cross. Um, system. The other thing you can do with these materials, and this, this is a complicated slide that doesn't need to be complicated, is we are actually working on telecommunications devices, and we wanted to make a polarization rotator. So what we did was make the cell. These yellow bits are electrodes across. This is a four electrode device for a display device. I only use two, and now I'm going to put stand the helix up and apply a field across the system so the helix tilts. What does that do for you? That gives you a very nice electro-optic effect. In the off state, if you look down through your helix, okay, so you have substrates, polarizer, glass plate, the coronamatic in this uniform standing helix, so the helix is up through the device now, apply a field across the system and the, 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 the axis to it. So it goes from optically isotropic to anisotropic to bioprinting. And you tilt the system to give you the bioprinting you want to make Okay, and that gives you a fast device, but it gives you something that is probably unique, and that is it can give you what I would call the perfect black 
the state. Because anything that's open to the anisotropic through cross correlates should be so it's <coughs> And if you get the pitch in your system right, the black is black. Okay? Along the pitch system, you've got optical rotation. Uh, as you come down in, in, in pitch, you, you need the uh, selective reflection band, if you want to call it that, out into the UV, and you start getting truly black devices. I call that black. Okay? Three micron thick device. Um, thicker devices, you've got more optical rotation, you get more light leak leakage. And you can prove this yourself by making a graded um, thickness sample. But black state is black. And that allows you to get con uh, contrast ratios in your devices six, seven, eight times to one. Okay, it depends on how well you can make your own. This is some early data just to show you you can get grayscale. Okay, this is this one of the first materials we made with um, Neo K1. Um, currently, <coughs> increase that by a factor of five, six, seven, but you can go from black through to light. <coughs> color filters, and you can display it. If you want to look at that um, more objectively, you can do that on a light box. Uh, and this is a, a uniform standing Helix cell on a light box between cross polars. Switched on. Transmitting. White. Black, white. Okay. Um, magnified up and look down the microscope, those little lines there are the electrodes. It's an implant field switching the optic axis. So to, to, to the eye, the black state is black. So a lot of fine art goes into um, making those devices good. But to summarize why uh, you can get Fast electric, uh, what the properties are, sorry, of the, of the photoelectric effect is you can get, you, you can use the ULH texture, the USH texture. The USH, and I'll come back to in a moment, and I'll mention briefly the lasers to, 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 to give Steve a lead in. But you're talking about microsecond switching times, low voltages, low fields, in fact, and very high contrast ratios. In fact, the contrast ratio of these test cells is better than the iPad. Okay. The iPad on that scale would be one, whereas these in-plane switching materials, um, it's, it's, it's better than that. But you have grayscale, okay, and you have analog switching, so the more voltage you apply, the more light you get out, so you control your iPad. You can switch it fast enough so that you get frames of color. Um, would I be telling you if this wasn't true? Um, this is a uniform standing helix display device, 17 inch display device, made by our collaborators in LG in uh, Korea, South Korea. So. And it kind of shows you that you can get good colour, fast speed, um, and you can actually make a display device, not just switching electrodes together. Um, okay, we have fun. You're privileged to see that, not many people have seen that video. The other thing you can do is you can use these materials to make blue phases. Um, pneumatic, the car pneumatic, double twist structure, and you make blue phases. And Flynn's going to talk about blue phases a little bit later on. But I just wanted to give you a taster through both blue phases and lasers as to why you should stay sitting in the audience. But I come back to one thing. When we made these materials, it came back to the fine visagents. Materials with high photoelectric coefficients. And I believe, and I think we've shown theoretically, that you stabilize the blue phase um, through the S minus half disconnection. Okay, the, lower, the, the, the elasticity allows you to form the, the uh, phase, and the photoelectric polarization holds the phase. So you can make these kind of mixtures. Um, if you have, actually, if you want to play games, you can play games. But you can put azo linkages in here if you want to and you can make photonically switchable in phase structures. Okay, as you go through the transistors, transverse and merit change, shape change. In fact, the first materials we made had ASOs in them as well. What did you want it? It's there, isn't it? <coughs> um, paradoxically, we were looking for nonlinear optical at the time, because that's actually a very good nonlinear optical try to second on light watch generating element. <coughs> That might look like a mess to you. It was heaven to us. 
Or was it heaven? Because if you come down in temperature, 57.4, 57.3, 57.2, you're forming a blue phase, forming two, two blue phases through there. And as you come on down, 57.4, 41, 25, the texture doesn't change. That's the first unaided blue phase stabilization that I'm aware of. Okay? Um, those textures don't look the same. As Finn will tell you, we've got tricks and all sorts of things up our sleeves where we can make that go from minus 125 to plus 125. <coughs> but it tells you you can do things with these materials. I, I think it's intrinsically the flexometric properties. You can switch to the blue phase colours if you can make a reasonably monodomain sample. You can make a red reflector. You can apply a voltage across the material or field across the material and you can change the colour. So in principle, you have a colour switch that doesn't have any polarisers, any analyzers, it just has a film of blue face material. And so again, we will talk about that a lot more. You can choose, or by choosing to some extent with the kitchen your system, you can <coughs> tune the photonic band gap to where you want. So you can actually make red, green, blue reflectors. Okay, narrow band reflectors, no polarizers, no color filters, just colored films. Okay, the simplest device you can imagine making. Okay, and then you can switch those colors, and that's what the real graph on the right showing you there. Okay. Either way. So to put the comparison into your minds, the selected reflection from a blue phase is narrow, from a polysteric will be much broader, but the same kind of material. And these, most of my usable mixtures run from about 80, 80 to about minus 20 degrees. <coughs> I'm only that without stabilization. You can play games, as you've heard over the last few days, <coughs> 10 days, I guess, um, by aligning a liquid crystal structure, a coronavirus, and then switching the surface. So what you do is you, you, you put some kind of, um, perhaps, ferroelectric material embedded onto a substrate, you switch the ferroelectric material, so you switch to polarization, and that switches or tightens up or, or dilates the helix in your car on the So you can actually make a tunable device. Um, that's with pure, in this case, car on the but it's a pure reflector. Um, there's only one hand in this, you can bring half the line to and you can put two films together. Um, but what, what I think is interesting is you don't change the Q factor or the fidelity, if you will, if you're an optician, um, of the cavity. So just by applying a field to the, the, the material, you can switch the color. You can put ferroelectric additives into the bulb. So here we have surface tuning. Okay, sorry. So we're switching the surface. There, you're switching the volume. You're putting uh, ferroelectric additives into the bulk of the system, and again, switching the fan gap. You can do that photonically as well. You can use azo groups and, and, and play games. Okay. What does that mean to, to, to you if you look at the device? And that's really what, what I'm interested in. Yes. That's the ferroelectric switchable device. You, so you're switching the reflected color up and down, red to green. And that's what you actually see when you look at the test cell. Okay. You, you, you have, uh, in this case, a serial one volts thereabouts. It looks green. The rings are just a kind of cover effect, or it's red. And you can switch that, and there's nothing else in there apart from the cell. Right, very quickly to um, onto the lasing, because that's very much what Steve's going to talk about in a moment. Um, why would you want to make a laser <coughs> If you talk to any self respecting chemist, they'll tell you that lasers organics don't go to get together too well. But if you play a game with the optics and you play a game with the structure, then I said Steve will talk about that, um, you can actually make very efficient lasers. So you don't have to worry so much about um, absorption in your, in your material. I like little toys. What I want to do is make a laser that's tunable that I can do that with. Okay. So I like optics as well. 
So I don't know why you do that, and how, again, why you get into doing that. Um, in a normal laser, that's the sort of argon ion or um, in the helium reactant in your system you have, in the lab you have a mirror, a mirror, a leaky mirror to let sunlight out, and then some method of amplifying. So you input, you pump the system either electrically or with light, and you uh, set up standing wave, you set up a gain medium to give you amplification. Okay? So you have a threshold, below which you don't see lasing, and then the more light you put in, you get gain. And that gain is what's important for the lasers. That, we call that the slope efficiency, um, and that's what we want to maximize so that we get nearly as much light out of the system as we put in. You can all go home and make a laser, like a crystal laser. What you need is a chiral a helical structure, so some chiral editing. I guess that could even be sugar. Um, you create a, a 1D for tight band gap, and you set up a cavity to give you gain. So, what have you got in here for crystals? You've got a chiral you've got a fluorescent emitter, you've gained. I skip, I skip the equations, but you get gain at the band edges, and when you photopump the system, you actually get nice lasing output. Okay, so that, that's what I just said. Physonic band gap, uh, a gain medium, the dye, absorption, fluorescence, put them together, and you get light out of what we call the band edge. How good that can be is shown now. Um, that, that's looking at the system in transmission, uh, where you see the absorption, you see the fluorescence. And that's the laser line coming out right at the band edge. That's the edge of the photonic band gap. The, the edge of your, your crystal forehead thermometer, if you want. If you look at the, the beam, it comes out of the system. It does look like a laser. It's almost gaun in the far field, it's almost Gaussian. Oh, sorry, it's Gaussian or near Gaussian, which is what you'd expect from a laser. But what's the advantage? That's the advantage. That's your laser. That's a liquid crystal test cell, maybe 10 microns, 15 microns in thickness. Okay, that's the laser. In this case, you're optically pumping the system and then looking at red light coming out. But you can have the uniform standing helix or the uniform line helix, so it doesn't matter how you illuminate the system, you always get light coming out along the helix axis, in the plane or perpendicular to the plane. And that's kind of unique to liquid crystal lasers. Cavity lengths of 10 microns, they're about. Um, the optic output normally along the helix axis. But why did I throw this in? Because our, our old friends, the bimetians, pop up again. These are a load of different structures, the alkyl oxy cyanobiphenols, uh, down to all bimetogenic materials. Okay? Um, keep that picture in mind, that one. Because when you get to Again, that's what you see. Bimetogen has the highest slope efficiency, the greatest slope, okay, compared with the, some of the cyanobiphenols. The, the bimetogenic structures have very high gain. And that means you're converting a lot of light uh, into a lot of, a lot of input into a lot of output. Um, the kind of slope efficiency you get in these systems is up to 60 70 percent. And that's why it doesn't matter that it's not handy. Um, one of the things that, that, that the Lego C will go on to is, is to tell you how you can make arrays of lenses. Where one little crystal test cell can give you red light, green light, blue light. Okay. And that's what, that's what that does. In fact, you can choose your, your laser output to be anywhere, if you're into, if you're into color diagrams, anywhere in the CI color diagram. And that is a lasing system where you've got blue light for the uh, green light 5.3, 5.30 pass, like and red at 6.17. And that's what the array in this case looks like. Okay, very simple. It's a little, 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 little crystal test cell. But you can do things with these. Uh, you, can, you can use the lasers to pump holograms and holographic images. Do that. Okay. But now it gets kind of wacky as Tim will probably put it. Um, you can start printing your lasers. You don't have to have 
a glass glass cell. You know that you can buy uh, flexible column PLC <coughs> type window devices. You can put ITO down onto, um, onto polymers and you can actually make a flexible laser. And that ought to make you think that's a bit weird. Because we were used to seeing lasers in the lab as like these laser pointers, solid objects. But you can actually make plastic lasers, plastic substrates. And that actually is a holographic image projected <coughs> using um, a piece of plastic laser. You can stack the colours together, you can make red, green, blue. I hope I'm not taking one of the talks, do I? Hope not. I didn't think I did. Yeah, I suppose I talked before me, you see. Um, but that's just a, a few of the things that, 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 that the guys in the LT have put the lasers down onto. Plastics, metal, paper. You can have paper lasers. That ought to make you sit down and think. Or, you can do what Damien and Cole have been doing more recently. You can actually inkjet print the lasers. That didn't ought to work, but it does. So you can use inkjet printing to print down laser devices. And then you can make each dot different if you want, if you want to. So you can have a multiplicity of colours um, inkjet printed down. And I can't think of an easier way of making a laser, quite frankly. Well, apart from getting inkjet printing to work in this case. But, but you can screen print. A printable laser is a, is a, is a concept. So, what I've tried to do in oh, three minutes, I should have stopped. Um, no, I've got three minutes. Yeah. Well, i carry on for three minutes. Right, great. Uh, what I wanted to do was show you that chiral crystals are more than just four thermometers. They're a photonic band gap structure. You can have 1D, 2D, 3D. I'd say Flynn and, and uh, Steve will talk about some of these details uh, in much more detail. But you can choose where the band gap is, so you can choose the colour, the wavelength, whatever you want. You can change the, the wavelength output of your system in the electric field, you can do it in magnetic fields, or you can do it in stress fields, or, or, or photonics. So you can make photonically tuned systems. But I think what surprised us the most is that we can get up to these conversion efficiencies of 16, I think the best we've ever seen is 70%. I said at the beginning, an organic chemist will tell you lasers and organics don't go together. But if you're converting all of the light that you're putting in, then you're not heating the system. So the higher efficiency, the greater the efficiency, then you can use your organics to, to, to a reasonable level. Um, I should say that we, I haven't pulled the details in, but, but we tend to not run the lasers much above 5, 6 milliwatts, quasi CW as it's called. So running at repetition rate of a kilohertz perhaps. But you can make arrays, um, you can make quasi CW lasers, which is all you need for a microscope or, or a lot of optical applications, or CR and the like. Um, you, can, you can play with the optics and micro optics. You can start thinking about different ways of doing spectroscopy with a multiple wavelength source, tunable multiple wavelength source, using a liquid crystal. I mean, so to me, you guys entering the field, there's a plethora, which is another way of saying there's a lot of applications. There's a large number of applications, and potential applications, of these materials. And that bottom line there is the key. Because liquid crystals are spontaneously formed. So you don't have to have big foundries growing um, crystal structures. You know, if, if any of you have been around our labs, I don't know if you have, you know, we have a, a, a little prep room for making our devices. You can go away and do it yourself. You, know, you, you really can. Um, so what I wanted to do, and that is what I wanted to finish, yeah, right. it comes back to thinking about <coughs> materials, the chemistry, designing the materials, studying the physics of their properties, and from the physics of their properties, taking that into the And that's what we try and do on the rest of the world. He's going through the whole gamut of organic chemistry physics to, to, to engineering. And because of that, you can get very fast switching devices, you can get very high contrast devices, very high threshold lasers, and very, very high temperature field lasers. And um, I can't think of another technology that could be more disruptive. So it's all going on. Well, thanks very much for your attention and coming. Small 
there can you build? What is the smallest size you can uh, build of a laser, uh, the liquid crystal laser? Ten micron by ten micron. Smaller than the human hair. Okay, the human hair is a diameter of roughly twenty micron. And we still have the same efficiency over sixty percent of it. Uh, yeah, we can. Yeah, in long-term efficient system. Um, I mean, the, most of the device, most of the data that I've shown is, is for a single spot device, so it's about ten microns, fifteen microns, perhaps. And what, what we did was went through all of the all of the parameters that could affect the conversion efficiencies. But see, twenty microns, ten microns. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends actually on the material properties. Yeah. The optimum thing, but there's an optimum thickness depending on what the optical properties of the pitch of the material. Is. Yeah. I've got another talk in there called size versus cows. <laughs> But, but are you going to talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I was just trying to give you a taste of tool to what you can do with materials. Other questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. You know, you used chlorinated by things. Chlorinated by messages, mm -hmm. different chlorinated for, I think so. So, we have that result that what mixing ratios you have know, optimized for few cases. Mixing ratios, because we have to do some trial and error. So, yeah, um, I guess it's serendipity. But when we made the first mixtures, um, we we were actually trying to make a highly a highly polar system for for um, second second high bond generation. Okay. And in doing that, we found that these materials. Uh, I had worked before about 20 years ago on making high temperature range brick lasers, and serendipity was that, that we found this phase that was about 30 degrees higher. So we then went back and said, well, what is it that's important? And that's been a, the last 10 years work, you know, uh, in 10 seconds. Um, but I think, personally, I think it's the photoelectric polarization that pins the S minus a half defect. Okay, there's, there's two processes. How you form the blue phase, you might regard as a function of viscosity or, or elasticity. But once you form it, how do you hold it back? And I think it's the plexoelectric polarization. If you, if you like, it, it's like um, a solid state a tetrahedron of, of dipoles that stabilize. But in this case, you've got three. Okay. One more question. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have replaced one or two, we have we have replaced one or two, we two. Can we drop something and can we actually replace three from that one? Yeah, I, I went pretty quickly through that. That, that cloudy texture, that blue. Yeah, I've seen that texture. That's why I was that to be P3. In fact, that, going through that sequence, I didn't, because I didn't know how many people would know the surfaces of PP1, 2, and 3. Okay. Um, but that, that actually had all of them, that, that, that mixture. Okay. Uh, you can you can play games, you can stabilize the, the PP1, 2, and 3. Okay. One more question I tried with the blue phase one mm -hmm. to drop a uh, level tubes. But uh, I found that I missed the two phases and I found wrong laser parallel geometric phase. That was the wrong. Yeah, so I am just uh, wondering why it happened. Probably the part of the particulars might be too big. Okay, let me tell you another, another experiment we did. Okay. With, um, so I thought Ivan had, I can tell you had done some of this work, putting CNCs into the disconnect. <coughs> the experiment that we did was, was to take. Um, Fluorocarbons, okay. they migrate to the defect line and they stabilize the blue phase. Don't know if I published that, I did about 10 years ago. Okay. But um, it's, well, I know we can publish it because we bought the additive from 3M <coughs> and then they stopped making it. So there would be a few good work. But we, we did make our own and putting the, the um, fluorocarbons, okay. try them. Yeah. And then there's a whole one of my group's thesis, um, Jung Il Chung. Yeah. Um, yeah, his thesis, there's a couple of chapters on that. Because he made his own um, hero, he was chemist working with a bunch of idiot physicists, you know. I mean. <laughs> and, and, and he looked at those phenomena. There's two or three chapters, it's in the, in the National Enterprise. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, good question, then. Okay, is there one last question?